filter. Hi, this is Moses Jacobs for the Barra Spoken Word and for the West Cork Feel Good Festival. And uh, I'm going to speak to Tony Cotter, uh, head of a, a really nice evening, Wings, Words and Music, which will contain exactly that. You'll find out later what the wings refer to. <laughs> uh, and there's two, um, two or three special guests. There's Tony Cotter here himself, who is a musician, but who will also be, he's also he's a singer-songwriter, so he also writes music, which is like, you know, and lyrics, and lyrics are like a kind of poetry. So he's also going to, to do some spoken word. And then there is James O. Flynn, who's going to be interviewed separately. And um, the same goes for him. There's a little story which each song, and but the songs will be played with a full band. And then the other special guest is uh, the MC Stan Knott, who will be also be doing, he's also a poet, and he will be doing a little bit of poetry on the night as well. So it promises to be a really nice event. 8.30 at the bar, spoken word, the bar's folk club, Cloney Guilty. Hello, Tony. Uh, hello, Moz. How are you? And can I say you're an absolute pro at what you do? Well, I've done lots of these videos. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we, I think we start. I can't remember even if we did it beforehand, but we started doing Zoom sessions during lockdown. And that has we been... Did. Uh, we did. We did, yeah. yeah, that's... That has been actually really nice because there was also lots of people from abroad and it, there were good month because it's a monthly event but we couldn't do it for you know for quite a while, so uh, I'm I'm sort of used to to the Zoom uh, interview so to put it that way. So uh, you are where at the moment? So I okay. So I'm currently uh, in Cov. I'm currently living in Cov. It's my humble abode for the moment. Um, I've been living here for over a year. Um, I guess I got my current place from living through my supervisor who I work for um, at the Harvey and Arming Bedding Warehouse in Little Island. Okay. Uh, he knew someone, he knew a landlord who was looking for a tenant. Or te yeah, and uh, uh, he passed my name by and hey, presto, here I am and the rest is history, I guess. Well, that's great. That's really great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, great if it's a nice house and it was an improvement compared to where you lived before then, wasn't it? Oh, oh absolutely, Moz. I mean, uh, you know, I went, you know, I went from uh, living in, a, well, look, and I'm not ashamed to say this, uh, live on air, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, I went from living in uh, a, uh, I guess a rat infested uh, squatter to going into treatment, staying there, you know, staying in a nice place for three months, being sheltered away from everything, all distractions, uh, social media, and, you know, and the general public as well. Uh, no newspapers, no mobile phones, nothing. No. Um, to then, you know, to then living uh, in a transition house, a lovely transition house. And then through that, I got this lovely place here where I, I currently live with my landlord. Um, my landlady uh, isn't currently here. She's over in Russia at the moment. But to cut a long story short, here I am and I'm happy out. And I'm only 20 minutes away from work. So it suits me down to the ground most. OK, that sounds great. It's it's near Cork yeah. City, so where you live. Yeah, it's about, it's about 20, about 20 minutes, I'd say most. Okay, and um, what kind of a day is today? Today is a very special day <laughs> uh, for me. Um, I am officially two years sober today. Okay, congratulations. Um, yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah, it's hard to believe. I never thought in in my wildest dreams I would make it this far. Um, but it's just yeah, but it's just look, it's proof in the pudding that if you really. You know, if you really set your mind to something, if you're really determined and, and if you put in a lot of hard work, you can achieve anything. And uh, and I'm and I'm proof that you can achieve a lot in yeah. such a short space of time. OK, that's that's amazing. How long have you I mean, you, you did you start making music when you were very young or when did you start playing? Music? Yeah, so. 
Yeah, most, I suppose um, it all started with my family, with my grandfather, with my mum. Um, and my family, really, my whole family, really were very encouraging because there is musicians within uh, my family. And there are, and so they were always encouraging us, uh, my brother and I, and my two sisters, to sing, to make music, uh, whichever way we liked. Um, and I guess when I was very young, the first instrument I remember trying to learn to play was the accordion. Um, and uh, I picked that up fairly quick, but I, 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 I guess I only played it for a couple of years and I set that aside because I didn't think it was cool enough. Um, and then I guess for a while, for a good long time, I, did, I, I paused and I stopped playing instruments. And I focused really on singing. So then I started. Uh, so, so from there, through my family shared love of music, I joined um, at the local choir from where I was living in Doris in West Cork. And yeah, and it just kept going. But all the while, knows, I never thought that you could actually make a living from playing music. For me, it was always just the love and the passion for it. It wasn't really... Uh, money wasn't really, the, you know, the motivator. It was just the passion and the um, and the love for it. And then it was only in my mid to late twenties that I started writing my own music and performing my own music. And um, you said you were from a musical family. Did your family uh, what 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 shape did that take? Did they go to sessions? Did they have sessions at home? Did they? Yeah. Yeah. So. Dance? Yeah. Yeah, so my grandfather, um, he was an amazing musician. Um, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, but he was an incredible musician, Most He could play saxophone, he could play accordion, and he could play a bit of guitar as well. And he could sing as well. He was a pretty good singer too. Um, but he started off in a band in Ballady Hub back in the, uh, in the late 50s called the uh, called the Pete Sullivan Band and he was with that band from 1957 I think until 71 and then he moved to Doris in West Cork and I guess other things took over his life and he kind of set music aside but all the while he was still having music sessions in the house and I can always remember being a youngster and he inviting uh, other musicians and singers over to the house and they would have music sessions there so, Mose, you know what? In a nutshell, I was always around music. Always, always, yeah. always. That's the best thing, isn't it? Yeah, so, it is. So, so I, because I think for lots of us, because obviously I make music myself and I, <laughs> I play your music as well. <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, for but for yeah, a lot of my people, band. you play in my band. Uh, spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but the um. For lots of people, including myself, it 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 can be nerve wracking to play music because you you're put on the spot and you have to perform in a way, and it has to be right. And once something has gone wrong in the past, where you lost your confidence, even as a child, and it's always difficult to to you know to disregard that. I'm finally there when I don't have to think about that all the time. But did you have any of that? Any of of, of the the nervosity or the anxiety that for some people is connected to music, even if they have a certain ability or talent. Yeah. So I think, so I think when I started playing uh, accordion and um, for, uh, yeah, for some reason I, back then I had no problem. I could perform in front of 10 people. I could perform in front of 20,000 people. It didn't really matter. I didn't, I, I had no inhibitions I was just playing while I was practicing and being taught by my grandfather. He's actually a very good teacher as well and very patient and uh, understanding. Um, and for singing as well, I always loved singing and performing for people. Um, it was only when I sp started singing uh, lead vocals in my first rock band, my first covers band when I was 25 or 26, the nerves really got hold of me then. And I can remember... <laughs> I can always remember the first gig I ever played. I literally had my back to the audience for nearly the whole session. It was, oh, man. It was like Miles moment. Davis, although I'm not sure yeah. it was to do with nerves. Maybe it was just he didn't like the audience or something like that. <laughs> was that accepted that you were 
turning your back to the audience? Yeah, um, it was just, I don't know what it was. I just, you know, I was just afraid what was going to come out of my mouth. Was it good enough? Was I afraid that there was fellow musicians in the audience where, you know, were people going to be scoring me out of 10? Who, you know, what were they thinking? All oh, these about 101 different uh, questions and thoughts are going through my head. But you know what, most at the end of the day, people, you know, are there to just enjoy the music. And mm. you know what? And the thing is, you know, musicians, whether you're, you know, experienced or not, or a singer, you're going to make mistakes. It's natural. But back then, I wasn't, you know, aware of that. I was just, you know, I was just so passionate, you know, about, you know, putting off the best performance I could. So hence why I had my back to the audience, you know. And how did people respond to that? Uh, they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were really cool. Um, yeah, and, they thought you were why, why, why your nerves then took hold of you? Was there any reason why they should? Um, I think, I yeah, I think you and I have spoken about this before. Um, but I think when uh, when I was a teenager, when I was a youngster or an early teenager, my mum, uh, my stepdad always put me down oh, yeah. the whole time. He would always ridicule me, always put me down. And so I carried that into my teenage and my and my young adult life. And I thought to myself, OK, well, you know, obviously I'm being here. You know, I've been hearing this for so long that this guy must be right. And what he's saying. So then no matter I felt, no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. So then I was so conscious uh you know physically and mentally um that uh, yeah that like i say i just carry that into my yeah. uh, you know teenage and my young uh, adult life so no so, so no matter what i tried my hand at, you know at or no matter what i tried his voice was always in my head saying you're not good enough you're not good enough you're not good enough and uh, did because of that had to do drink was a, was another way of drowning out that voice maybe yeah Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, Moses, when I took my first drink at 15 and a half years of age, now the thing is I had my first drink in front of my mother because she took me into the pub because she, she would rather, she knew if she didn't, that I would do it behind her back and she would rather supervise me Yeah. and, you know, and be there when I have my first drink. And Moses, something incredible happened back then. It was like this... This, you know, it was like discovering the uh, the Holy Grail. It was like from the first drink, I knew I loved it. I knew I enjoyed it. And from the first moment I tasted a drink, I wanted more because it gave me a feeling that I was on this, on this pink, purple cloud, whatever it was. No one could touch me. No one could say anything to me. And I felt a lot more confident, you know, in anything I did. You know, whether it be talking to girls uh, public speaking, singing, performing, you know, a drink was, you know, alcohol was so attractive or so attractive to me uh, because then, you know, all my inhibitions went away and it, you know, and it gave me the, you know, the confidence to be able to perform as a musician and as a singer. So what went wrong in a way? I mean, you'd say, okay, just have a drink or two before you start performing and then that's it. And, you know, um, something happened that that it became a problem. It did. A problem. It did. It certainly did. It's it, it certainly did, honey. It did become a problem. It become a uh, it became a massive problem. Um, and I tended to use it, and I did use it a lot as a crutch for when I was performing. Um, and that's a bad thing. And I would need a couple of drinks before I go on stage and perform. And sometimes. It went horribly wrong where I got terribly drunk before going on stage because I felt I needed more and more and more to be able to you know perform. So it's yeah. So it bit me on the ass several times. And have you written a song about this? Is it in your songs? Um or not yet. Are you going to write a song about this? Yeah, yes, yes. I'm in the process of trying to write new material. Um but you know what, Moses, it all comes down to when I actually get a chance and when I'm in a, you know, alone in a room where it's appropriate to belt out a song and not having to worry about, you know, noise pollution and all that, you know, yeah, all yeah. that, 
you know. So what but are yeah, you yeah, songs yeah, about? I want to spare, so I am I am working on new material. That's great. What are your songs about? Uh, the new ones are the, uh, the new well, ones are the let's concert. say the ones that you're going to sing on the twenty third of you know of October, the ones we're okay. Rehearsing um, at the moment, and and actually you're gonna start early. You're gonna start on the fifth and the sixth of October, right in Dunmanway. And the uh, on the fifth of October, isn't it? The fifth of October yeah. in Dunman in in Dunmanway. Yeah, okay. Um. So Maybe I suppose. The uh, okay. The, yeah, the songs. Uh, the songs are a culmination of, uh, to uh toxic relationships, um. Being there for people, um, showing your admiration and your love for people, um, it's about riding stormier seas and making it out at the other side. It's about going through hell and high water and still making it out at the other end, uh, and you're fully still intact mentally and physically, and um. And it also, and these songs are about a reigniting one's passion for life and for music and for people and beginning and, and also to beginning to trust people again, to trust yourself and to, and to be grateful for what, you know, and, and to be grateful for what I have. Oh, that sounds like a lot. Um, there's two more questions. I mean, do you because this is going that twenty third and also the yeah. um, the yeah. gigs earlier in October. Yeah. They're part of the West Cork Feel Good Festival, which is you know about around mental health as well as pure enjoyment. Yeah. I think and pure yeah. enjoyment obviously is is a sign of good mental health. Um, yeah. yeah. What 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 is to you the relationship between mental health and music? Okay, well, I think first of all, anyway, I think it's a very positive one, um, and I think it's very stimulating, and I feel that, I think that, I think the music uh, a lot of the time is overtaken by, yeah, look, there's too many virtuosos out there, and you know, look, and I don't mean to put down virtuosos, but I feel that, you know, I feel that music, um. That there's a lot of elitism, but I think it's. Uh, but I think you have to develop a mindset to look past the whole elitist, uh, mm. you know, gathering um, and thing in general. And um, but I think the music uh, as a whole uh, is one of the best ways to battle and to maintain mental health and well-being. And I feel whether you're a poet, whether you're a musician, whether you're a singer, I think that music. Is such an incredible and such a rewarding way to, uh, to you know, to regain one's confidence mm. and yeah, and to make you a better person within yourself. And I feel, you know, that for me, there is no drug or drink in the world that can give me that satisfaction and nirvana. You know that I create a song, and I create it. It comes out of nothing, Mose. You know this yourself from creating music. You you know. I mean, I mean, you're one of the best saxophonists I've ever heard in my life. Not and to hear you, <laughs> and to hear you, okay. and to hear I you. paid you to say that. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I. And you know, and to hear you, you know, personally, to hear you, you know, playing in my band, and to hear you with these beautiful notes and these melodies that you come out with, and they come out of thin air. Yeah, you know, and true. you notice yourself in creating beautiful music that there is no drug or drink in the world that can give you the euphoric, you know, nirvana, you know, to say, oh, my God, I'm after creating this and I'm hearing this. And yeah, then yeah, but you... I think that's actually a bit and, I, and that's my next question is about that as well, because but I think the best moments are when you do not have to think about anything and it just comes through you. It's not you making it. It's you opening up. The, yeah. The yeah. States, so to speak because you told me once about how you wrote your songs the songs that you were going to sing some of them and that was quite a process as well wasn't it uh, it was um you know it was most because from you know what i guess from the age of 25 <clears throat> i started to try and take songwriting a lot more seriously and and you know i didn't want to spend my whole life 
playing other people's music, singing other people's music. I wanted to see where this whole songwriting adventure would take me. <clears throat> and I, you know, so then I embarked in trying to start writing my own lyrics, creating my own music. You know, now at the start, it wasn't the best in my opinion. Uh, now, if you ask me, um, you know, have I got recordings? Have I got, you know, recordings and things like that of my early, you know, attempts at, you know, writing and singing music? Uh, a lot of it has been lost. I think most of it has been lost. But but the point I'm trying to make is that the more that I stuck with it and the more that I would shedded uh, songwriting and and you know and the fact that I kept writing songs, eventually good stuff started to emerge. And it wasn't only until a few years ago that I thought, okay, something okay, there's something to this. Uh, you know, my music and my lyrics are starting to sound pretty good here. So there is definitely something to this. Um, so I guess my whole songwriting process, first of all, it came out of just wanting to really write my own songs. And then it really came to the fore when I was um, a backing singer and a guitarist in James O'Flynn's uh, Clad Rogues touring band back in 2017, because, you know, J uh, James inspired me to start writing or to continue to write my own songs. And that really, and that really, um, you know, I gained momentum for me because then I was really determined in writing my own uh, material because I thought, man, if James can do it, I can do it. Okay. Okay. So would you say that your song, songs came out of nothing or did they come because of hard? I think, uh, I think they came, uh, um, I think they came out of different areas. I think they came from different uh from different uh, inspirations and aspirations i mean you know some of my lyrics are about my deceased mum some of my lyrics are about relationships i was in some of my lyrics were are uh, some of my lyrics are about just you know having a zest and a love for life um and regaining my mental health and my uh, you know and my dignity and my pride you know, for my life and my well-being. And also some of my lyrics are about being at the bottom, the very bottom, uh, you know, of the barrel in terms of addiction and alcoholism and emerging and coming out the other side. And so some of my songwriting is through my celebrating my determination, um, you know, to actually battle alcoholism and come out the other side and saying, hey, you know, here I am. And hey, presto, I've made it to the other side. Thank you very much. That is a very fitting ending. And I look forward to seeing you on the 23rd of October in the Barras. And I look Hot forward club. to it as well. I can't wait. I can't wait <laughs> to share my music with you. Okay, let's do that.